because I did that yesterday. And I know it was good, but I'm sure you don't want to hear it again. So we'll do something else instead. We'll do MVVMC in practice. If that's not what you're in the room for, please feel free to go somewhere else. So if you've just come in for a nap, that's fine as well. It's, uh, so, it's the downhill slope. You've had a day and a half of your, your minds being crammed full of information. And now they've just stuffed you full of lunch. And you've come into this room because it's got the comfiest chairs. <laughs> Let's be honest. Okay? So that you can, you can have a nice nap. And I'm going to aid you by showing you lots and lots of slides of code. Because the best way to fall asleep is just to look at other people's code. Just like in those code reviews Laura was talking about this morning. Okay, it said, hi, my name is uh, Steve Scott. Everybody calls me Scotty. Uh, I do host the iDeveloper podcast. And I have been a freelance developer since 1992. A long time. And in that time, I've seen a lot of code bases. I actually became a paid developer in 1987. And I think I wrote my first line of code in 1981, which looking around this room means most of you weren't born. <laughs> when I was writing code. Boy, do I feel old. I'm about 10 years too late for Adrian's life developer at 40. He should have been around 10 years ago to give me that one, so I've not done any of that stuff. But I've survived, and I'm here, and I may have to come back next year to do being a developer at 50, because then I can just be 10 more than he did. Great. OK, so after being a developer for so long, and especially a freelance developer, you tend to get called in as a freelance developer to fix projects that are broken, to work out what has gone wrong with things. And often when you begin to see a brand new code base, uh, one of the first things you look at is how that code base is structured. And as you begin to see how it is structured, you begin to get a reasonable idea of is this project savable or not. Because all projects have problems. None of us get it right first time. There's always something to do with performance, or there's certain bugs, or whatever else. Especially the bigger the project, the more issues there are going to be. But when a code base is well structured, well designed, and well laid out, your chances of fixing those things, your chances of rescuing those things, your chances of actually getting something to ship are far higher than when everything is just a mess and tangled up. And you do learn over the years. It becomes not easy, but you do begin to realize this code is unsavable, or this code is savable, based on, on, on what you see. So, um, I want you to listen carefully to what I'm about to say now. I know you've come in here for a sleep, um, but if you just listen to these next two minutes, you're going to get the gist of everything I'm going to say, and then you can, feel sleep, you can fall asleep then without even feeling guilty. Because when someone asks you what was the session about, you can say, and no one knew you were asleep. I think of you guys when I design this stuff, you know. Okay, so... In my however many years as I've lost count uh, of, of being a developer, the one thing I've learned is what you need to master, just as Adrian said this morning, is principles. Okay? Programming is very different today to what it was in 1981. It's very different today to what it was when I was in college in about 84. Okay? When I was in college, the coding technique, the structuring technique I was taught was called Jackson Structured Programming. Okay? And what that basically meant is we were being told as developers for the first time, why don't you break your code up a little bit instead of having this massive one long function you call a program? Well, the program started at the top, they finished at the bottom, and if they were complex, they had some go-tos in so they could go back to the top and do it all over again. And this concept came in of, why don't we split things up? Now, I haven't had to use Jackson Structured Programming as a technique since probably about 1986. However, some of the principles and fundamentals for why I was being told to use Jackson Structured Programming are exactly the same today. They haven't changed. So I said, let's talk about MVVM. Okay? But I actually could have chosen any architecture-based system to talk about. I chose MVVM because at the time I first gave this talk, it was sort of like a little bit of sexy new hotness in the iOS world. Okay? Whereas if I'd said, let's talk about MVC, you'd have all said, oh, we know about MVC. I'm going to go to one of the other sessions. You might have had an empty room. Okay? But because it's MVVM, yeah, that may be a little bit cool. Let's go see some MVVM. But the reality is it really doesn't matter. Okay? We are going to go through MVVM. We are going to look at code. The reason we're going to look at code 
is because I could easily stand up here and talk to you just about principles, and you would all nod at me, and you'd all say, great, and then you'd all go home and do nothing about it, because that's what we do with principles. But if you've seen some code, the thing you work with every day, there's a small chance that some of it may think, you may think, oh, I could do that tomorrow. I could start breaking out today, and some of this stuff may begin to wheedle its way in. That's the plan. Whether it will work or not, we will find out. Whereas my presenter notes are all the way over here. This is a great stage, by the way. I like pacing. If you were in my session yesterday, you know, in, in the small room with the small stage, I was like this. <laughs> yeah, whereas now I can, oh, I'm as free as a bird. It's amazing. I love it. Sorry, I'm just indulging myself. I cannot have a stage like this and not enjoy it. Yeah, if you ever get the chance to be up here, enjoy the fullness of the stage. Okay, right. I've said about principles, so we can be, what happens when you don't have your presenter notes, see? Okay, what is my goal in, in the code I'm showing you? Because the techniques I'm going to show you today is, is something I used on a small project uh, last year sometime, and so I want to tell you why it was structured this way. I wanted to share as much code as possible between iOS and OS X apps. Okay? It's impossible to share all code, but as much code as possible, because this, this application was going to work on both platforms. I wanted good test coverage. He sat at the front. Scott's there staring at me. I had to put that in just for him. Okay? I wanted good test coverage. And the way you structure your code determines how testable it is. I also wanted it to be easy to test. Because one of the problems is every moment we get an excuse because something's difficult, we don't do it. So we need to make our life as easy as possible because then we do it. We're not very good when we come across resistance. It's things like testing, uh, code reviews, all this stuff go out the window the moment it becomes hard. Whereas the easier we make it for ourselves, the more likely we are to do it. And I wanted some flexibility. I wanted some flexibility in what I did. Okay. Right. We should all recognize this, yeah? Model view controller. I've no idea why it's called MVC because it's like that should be view controller model or something, but someone obviously decided that was the order it was going to go in, and so that's what we live with. Model view controller, or massive view controller as we love to call it these days because that's what we write. There is nothing wrong with model view controller. Model view controller is a perfectly good way of structuring code. The main issue why we all these days it's trendy to laugh at model view controller is because iOS's implementation makes doing good model view controller difficult. It sort of teases us into thinking we're doing model view controller, but we're not. And it's even named the classes, things like UI controller or UI view controller, so that we think that we've got this view and this view controller and, and this model stuff. But the reality is, it doesn't work that way. Because we all know you have to do view setup code in the view controller. So immediately now, your view controller is actually got part of the view in it. So the immediate reason for doing this, which is to separate the things you're doing, in the very implementation we're given out the box is broken. So the problem isn't MVC, the problem is UIKit. Okay? It's not structured this way. Or if we just obey the name of the classes, it's not structured very well this way. Okay. So I could have just said, given this talk, saying, well, let's use the classes properly within Model View Controller. But that would have been a little bit more confusing for us, because now we're trying to work against everything that's been ingrained in us since we've become iOS developers. So equally, choosing MVVM, which is slightly different, gives us just that little bit of separation again from what we're used to, to maybe be able to take these very simple things and out the way. So here is the first thing you've got to get to grips with. In UIKit, the view controller is actually part of the view. Stop pretending it's the view controller. It's not. It's part of the view. You do view setup code in there. You're referencing the fields on the, uh, that are on the screen in there all the time. It is part of the view. And so we have to say that UI view together, and all the controls that are made up from UI view, and the view controller are going to be the view part of this architecture. OK? And then what we're currently calling the view controller, if we're using MVC, we are going to call a view model. But it could actually still be called view controller. Just don't tell anyone. Mm -hmm. Because then it wouldn't like make MVVM exciting, would it? OK? And then we have the model, which is exactly the same as it is in model view controller. OK? So we have to firstly put our view and our view controller together to create the view. 
And then we have this thing called the view model, which is going to take the place of what we would currently call the controller. And then we're having the model which deals with data. I'm just going over to my presenter notes again. OK. Basically, what we are after here is a good separation of concerns. That is always the goal. Whatever technology or way of breaking your code up you choose, whatever acronyms uh, are the trendy ones today that you're going after, it's always about a separation of concerns. Keep things that belong together together. Keep things that don't belong together apart. Okay? Keep them apart. So our view is all about presentation and user input. It should do absolutely nothing else. All of the business logic, including what decides what data should actually end up on that view, need to be done in our view model. And then the handling of the data is going to go on in the model. Okay? Or what we call the CRUD stuff, create, read, update, delete. So that is what we're after. It's just about keeping those things apart. Anything you use, if you use one of the new ones, um, the new trendy thing, I think is Viper at the moment, which has got about nine layers, but it's still exactly the same principle. Are things separate? And that's what we're after. OK. The trouble is, this doesn't work. The reason it doesn't work is because there's nowhere for navigation to go. Because the moment I introduce navigation to any one of these layers, I'm introducing something that doesn't belong with something else to something. Navigation doesn't belong with my business logic. Okay? Navigation definitely doesn't belong with my data. And navigation doesn't really belong with the view. So the reason that I added a C on the end, and I've adopted um, the title of coordinator, okay? um, which someone whose name I've totally forgotten first introduced about a year ago. Was, that's where I first heard it. I don't know if he introduced it. Um, I'm trying to give him credit, but I can't remember his name. But you will agree that I'm trying to give him credit yeah, for the name. I'm not owning it myself. As long as I'm not in any breach of any copyright, that's OK. So I've introduced a thing called C, which is coordinators. Now, coordinators are going to control the navigation and the flow of the application because it doesn't belong anywhere else. Um, because you know, navigation is, can be very particular. And the moment you put navigation into anything, anything to do with your business model or anything like that, you're now locking something into a certain flow path. Whereas if you keep it separate, you can use that business logic again and again in whatever flow path you wish if something else is taking control of the navigation. Everyone with me so far? About four of you are awake. That's good. <laughs> That's three more than I was thinking by this point of the presentation. So I'm doing OK. I'm doing OK. Right, so we have a demo app. We have a demo app. OK, it has a login screen because we're going to deal with this. If you were in my password talk yesterday, this follows none of the good practice that I told you about yesterday, OK? Absolutely zero of it, OK? So, but I didn't want to complex. Com so, OK, so what happens is you log in. This is my crew iOS um, crew command system or crew personnel system. So when you log in, you get a list of your crew. So we've got to get a bit of a Star Trek reference in here. And if you click, do you notice I have my best designers on this? Yeah? That's it. And uh, so if you click on any one of those, you get their full and comprehensive employment details. OK? And if you click the Done button, you end up going back to this. It's an incredibly simple app. But what it shows us is it shows us a simple data entry screen. It shows us a list screen. It shows us a child view or a detail view. It gives us enough that we can look at some principles as we go through. OK. Who here is currently using Swift as their main language? OK. Who, keep your hands up a moment. Who's using Swift 3 as your main language? About three of you. OK, right. Um, the code is in Swift 3. I will talk through some of the Swift 3 points as I can do. Who's here still using Objective-C? I say still like you, sh like you shouldn't be, OK? It's, it's not. <laughs> Who is embracing the C culture and sticking with Objective-C for now? <laughs> OK, that's nobody. Anyone writing in Java? OK. So I'm talking about iOS, and we have lots of Android engineers in here. Let's see how this goes. The principles are the same. I don't know. I'm talking about view controls. OK, the principles are the same. OK. Right. Swift. Protocols. Everything in this talk is going to use protocols. OK? A protocol is simply a contract. It's a statement of intent with no implementation. The reason everything is going to use protocols is because you can define your interfaces to everything, 
but you're making no commitment to the physical class, not the physical, because they don't everything is protocols. Now, if you're working in Objective C, you have protocols. They're just implemented slightly differently. They're maybe not as core to the language, but you can still do stuff with protocols. Right, so let's start with our, um, our view. This is the view. Remember, it says UI view and view I view controller, but it is the view. I'm going to say that again and again and again. OK. The view collects data and presents data. The view makes no decision about what data it presents. All that code deciding, do I presage this? Do I display this? Not in your view. All your view is going to do is display the data it is given. You could even argue it shouldn't even decide how it's formatted, the data it's given, if it's things like strings, because that should be given, it should be given to it in the format it's already needed to be in. It really should be as dumb as possible. The view is the least reusable thing in your application. The view is the least testable thing in your application, or the hardest thing to test. The less code you have in your view, the better. Every time you find yourself writing code in a UI view controller, or in part of your view, you should ask yourself, am I doing the right thing? Is this correct? So this is just about presenting stuff. End of story. So if it's just about presenting stuff, then it needs stuff to present. And that's where the view model comes in. So a view model is one of the first responsibilities of a view model is to present data to the view. OK. So let's take a look at the pass. I'm, I've given up on my presenter notes. If I miss something, we'll cover it another way. Um, although I probably might go back in a minute. Uh, so let's take a look at the login screen from this application. Okay, so we have an email address and a password and a button. Okay, it will actually also display an error message to you as well if you fail to log in. So that's, that's the complexity of this form, not a lot to it. So it's implemented in a class of called MMVC Authentication View Controller. By the way, as well, I, this code will not pass any of Laura's tests either. Okay, in code review, she would throw most of this code out. Okay. It is not necessarily designed to be readable. It's um, just because it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you can probably clean it up. OK, so it's implemented in a view controller. And it has a view model property. OK, so if you're not used to Swift, when you set up a property in Swift, you have this concept of you can do will set and did set. The will set will get run before the property gets set. It's fairly obvious, really, isn't it? And, and the other one will get set after it's got set, but it gives you a chance to deinitialize what was currently there and reinitialize what was there. So all that's happening in our view here, and, and we'll come back to the view delegate stuff in just a moment, is when you set a view model, it refresh calls a method called refresh display. Refresh display simply takes the data in the view model and puts it into the fields. Now, if you had 200 fields on this screen, it wouldn't be the most efficient way of doing it by having to keep refreshing all 200. But I have to say, if you have 200 fields on an iOS screen, sack your designer, find another one, get it down to six. And then this will work. It's probably the approach that I would take. OK? Um, so really, it's just about taking it and putting it on the screen. So there's this argument in the MVVM world about whether view models should be immutable. Okay? Everything's about things should be immutable. And in general, I'm a fan of immutability. Because every time you make something mutable, you introduce the opportunity to make things more complex. And the more complex things are, you get bugs. It's, you know, it, this stuff isn't really that difficult, is it? We just like to make it more difficult, because then we can justify asking for higher salaries. Um, but actually, however, sometimes you have to work with immutability. Sometimes you have to make things mutable. Sometimes it's just. You know, the effort of every time someone types something into that password field, I need to know about that somewhere. Do I need to create a new data object every time someone's creating it? I made the decision, I am in this, in this particular architecture, I am going to have mutable view models. It may not be the right decision in the way you do things, but in this app, it's using a mutable view model. OK, which means that as data changes in the view, it updates the view model. So here we can see the email field did change, which is set up as the delegate, and the password field did change. And all they're doing is updating the equivalent properties on the view model. So this is a very simple way of doing it. 
Not the way you have to do it, but it's the way this is doing it. Equally, when the login button is pressed, the login button does nothing. Your controls really, in your view, should do nothing other than tell the view model that they've been pressed. Because the view model is responsible for the business logic. If you're writing any other code, you should be asking why. Because that code, is, when it's in the view, is going to be hard to test. How are you going to know it's going to run? So we need them. OK, everyone with me so far? Hey, one more person's woken up than just now. <laughs> this is good. This is going in the right direction. If I keep going long enough, you'll all be awake. That's good. OK, so if we are going to have a view model where the data changes, our view also is going to have to know if things change or the state of that new model changes. So we have introduced a complexity there. So as well as the view, uh, the view having a view model as a property, we are going to make the view a delegate of the view model so that the view model has a way of saying things have happened. Now, whether the view bothers to do anything with that is up to it, but the view model itself. OK, so this is simple delegation that if we work with UIKit, you're used to all the time. OK, so this is where it came back to here. So when the view model is being set in the view, we set the view delegate property of the view model to ourself. And we nil it. When, when, uh, we nil the old one, set the new one to ourself. OK. Um, I've called it view delegate, not delegate, just delegate. Because as we'll see as we go through, the view model has a number of delegates on it, so it could speak to a number of different things. We could have done this with KVO. OK, so instead of um, the view model, the view having to become a delegate of the view model, the view could have just used KVO to look at the view model. However, I personally am not a fan of KVO uh, for a no number of reasons. Um, I think the code you have to write is very messy to deal with KVO. And I find debugging KVO incredibly difficult. Um, I find, although delegation is probably more code, and maybe not quite as flexible as just using KVO. When, when the code crashes, if something goes wrong, you tend to have a very clear stack you can follow back to know where it's come from, to know why it's done. Whereas KVO, it's sometimes a little bit more mysterious than that. So that's personal taste. But again, it doesn't matter. Some form of notification system, view model, uh, delegation, KVO. If you want to go really wild, you could use notifications, but that's probably not wise, because notifications shouldn't be between connected things. They're there for a more app-wide distribution. OK, so that means that the view model needs to have a delegate protocol. This code is very small. This code is on GitHub. I'll give you the link at the end. So as long as you get what I'm talking about a little bit, that's fine. You can go read the code properly, probably later. So in this case here, I've kept this as simple as possible. All that view model is going to tell us is, did the submit status change? In other words, have I now got a, what looks like a complete username and a complete password? We don't know if they're valid yet, but we know that they pass the initial test that your view could do. Okay? And if that's the case, the submit, state, the submit state will change. And what will happen in the view is when it sees the submit state change, it will enable the login button. So that's the purpose of this. And equally, an error message did change. Uh, message so that if we're logging in and the error message goes wrong, something goes wrong, we'll get that status. This is a little bit contrived, OK? I'm not saying this is the exact way. I've contrived stuff to show principles, not necessarily pure implementations of things. So there's the implementation in the view of that um, view model delegate. We're basically seeing we're going to enable the login button. We're going to set the error message label to the text when we see the error message changed. OK. Hopefully, all fairly straightforward stuff so far. Cool. I have no idea what's next. I'm going to be as surprised by the next slide as you are. Ah, we're going to talk a bit more about the view models. OK, so what is the point? That's it for views. If your view does any more than that, you have to ask yourself why. OK, just displaying the data, passing it back, responding to data changes. Your view model. Purpose of the view model is to get data from the model. I, I really wish we could come up with some different terminologies. We have views, view models, models. It's like you know, I'm, I'm presenting this stuff and I'm confused, let alone you know, what anyone listening to it is like. OK, so we get data from the model. We also send data back to the model. We provide data for the views, and we inform the views of data change. 
We put our business logic inside our view models, although that business logic should probably be implemented by some sort of classes or, or, or whatever to make it there. And we communicate our state to a coordinator. I'll come back to that one, okay? Just trust me that that's needed at the bottom. So let's, um, let's point that in the right direction and something might change. Our view model is declared as a protocol. It doesn't have to be, it could just be the class with this structure. But declaring it as a protocol means that I can put any type of class that fits this protocol in as the view model for that view without changing it. So I might change the login system by actually replacing the view model, but I don't have to replace the view because we just fit. So, okay. so we can see that we have the view delegate, which is the delegate method that's going to be touched with the view. We see we have the email, the password, the can submit thing. The function called submit, that is what the view calls when the submit button's pressed. And then we have the error message. So let's just take a look, quick, quick look at see the, um, the properties in here. So we said, this is an example. So we had email. Remember when we were typing in the username? Well, so it was email. It was updating the email property on the view. What is happening here? Is it just checks if it, is it in a valid format using a method you can't see in here, but is in the code? Um, checks if that now is something that could be submitted. If it can be submitted, it calls the can submit on the, on the view delegate, so the view delegate knows we're gone. Hopefully, if you're an iOS developer, all this is pretty logical stuff. If you're an Android developer, you're sat there thinking, why am I in this session? Probably. OK, can submit. Again, just a Boolean. We'll just skip forward this. I'm just trying to show you where the code is. All right, so here's, let's just take this. This is the submit method. This is very small, so let's just step through a little bit. OK, so remember, this is the method that gets called on the view model when the submit button is pressed in the view. OK, so first of all, we just check if we can submit. We shouldn't really get here if we don't. But there, we check that we have a data model, because the login is going to be handled by the data model. Otherwise, we set an error message, and we return. We'll look at the error message in a moment. OK. We set up a block of code, a closure of code that we're going to use in a moment. We'll come back to that. And then we call the login method on our data model. How you implement your data models is, you know, there's no fixed way of doing this. But I tend to give them explicit functions to do a certain thing. I try and make the understanding that the view model has to have of the internal structure of the data its absolute minimum. Okay? So actually, I know the data model is going to do a login for me. It's going to look something up in a database, maybe. Maybe it's going to go off to a server somewhere and check it. I don't know. I don't care. I just know it's going to log in. That's all I need to know. And then we have a completion handler. Within this implementation as well, I have made the assumption that every single data model method will be asynchronous with a completion handler. It may not be true, but if you implement every single one that way, it always gives you the option to put an asynchronous function underneath when you need to, to go to a network server instead of a local database, and you don't break your code. So let's go back to the completion handler that happens once the login is done. Um, this, by the way, if you are um, new to Swift 3, this is now how you do GCD um, stuff. It's, it's a lot nicer than the stuff we dealt with before. It's, I would almost go as far as saying, it's beautiful. Let's just admire it for a moment. Yeah, I like that. Good. OK, moving on quickly. Uh, if we get. Uh, this is where this code would probably be thrown out for not being very readable because it's sort of um, the happy path is, is the not expected path. We see if there's an error. If there is no error, okay, we call our coordinator delegate. I'll come back to that later, uh, saying something. And otherwise, we've set the error message. If we're setting the error message, it's doing exactly the same as the other ones did. It's calling the view delegate to say the error message to change. That means our view will update itself. OK, so just going back to this moment <coughs> that we're calling our coordinator. We've not spoken about coordinators yet, but let me just bring something in here. The, the reason it's doing this, this is where normally in your code you'd now write, you, you'd now stick the next view on the navigation stack, doing whatever it is. Okay? This is where you would introduce navigation code to your view controllers normally. Okay? But the moment you've done that is you have locked this view control, this model, you have locked this view model 
into having to be used in that place in the flow because the only place it can go next is wherever you've just set it to. By linking up with a coordinator, which will be another protocol, and saying, this view has now finished and I've finished in a happy state, the coordinator can decide where to go next. That means this view model now can be locked anywhere into any flow, any navigation flow, without breaking code or having to have big if statements about application state or anything like that. That's why we break things out into coordinators. How am I doing for time? Terribly. I'm going far too slow. OK. Error messages we've already dealt with. Models. Let's move into the models then. So we've done views. We've done view models. Everyone, I, I'm, I have to keep testing. Everyone with me so far? Wow, most of you have woken up now. <laughs> that must have been a really exciting section. <laughs> Didn't know it was that good. That's great. <laughs> right, models. So models are responsible for handling data. OK. Uh, everything you do in a model, again, should be protocol driven. Even more important. If you're only going to use protocols in one place, use it at this level. Okay, the rest you can, well, you have to sort of use it for delegates and things, but the rest, if you didn't want to, I can use sort of, this level will do it. Okay, the model is responsible for handling all data access. Your code should nowhere else touch anything to do with data. It should never be looking at NS user defaults. It should never be looking at a database. It should never be looking at the network. Never, ever, ever, unless it's in the model. Okay? Because you need the ability to switch things in and out and do it, and you do not want this code anywhere else. These separation of concerns is what make projects savable or not savable. Okay? Because you can switch things out, you can fix one bit of the program. You'll often find that the issues in code you come across will be in one area. And if those areas are nicely separated from everyone else, you can like almost like, if we rewrite all the model classes, this app will now work. And we can do that without breaking anything else, and therefore that's great. And especially as we'll have unit tests coming out of our ears. Scott came back in the room, I had to add that. Okay? <laughs> coming out of our ears, we can then prove that our new classes will work with what we had before. I use functions, not properties, on models. That's my choice. We could just say, um, you ju could just have a property to use on a model to get the data from. I always use a function. I always assume the function is asynchronous, and I always have a completion handler on it because that gives me maximum flexibility to change things in the future. Okay, this is all about planning ahead in a way that doesn't actually really cost me anything. Okay, writing a few more lines, a few more characters on the function as opposed to on the property really don't cost me much. Um, I've said everything on there now. Good, I've done my job. Right. So the authentication model has one method on it called login. It takes a password, it takes an email and a password and a completion handler. This is the new Swift 3 syntax when you're using completion, um, when you're using blocks as variables, okay? In Swift 2, it was assumed that a block will be what's called escaping, okay? And I'll tell you what that is in a moment. Whereas in Swift 3, it's assumed that a block will be non-escaping. And so if a block is going to be escaping, you now have to mark it as escaping. Now I better tell you what escaping is, because otherwise all that is a waste of time. Okay, basically the simplest way of saying this, and it's a little bit more technical, but the simplest way of understanding this is, does this code need to still exist after the function it's being passed to has finished? Okay, so as when you call into the login function, is the code we're passing in the completion handler going to be needed after the return call in the login function is executed? Now, in almost all asynchronous code, the answer to that will be yes, because the method will return, and the other thing will be over here, running. If it's a synchronous code, then the answer will be no, because you'll run the block inside the thing and then come out again. Okay? So what you're basically saying is this block of code will escape the lifetime of the function that it's being passed into. That's what you're saying. Everyone make sense with that? I can't tell if anyone's shaking their head from here because I can't see you all, but there was enough yeses and whatever that, eh. if you didn't understand that, someone next to you just said yes, ask them afterwards because they can now explain it to you and prove that they really did. <laughs> That's what I say. Someone sat there and said, I didn't say yes, I didn't say yes. <laughs> right, okay. So let's take a quick look at our model. Okay. It's got one method in it, login, does the escaping stuff, it implements it. Oops. Okay. Uh, we can see this is the 
how you put something on a background queue, the global background queue in GCD now. You can create your own queues like you could be able to use the path. Okay, as you can see, this is a really secure app. The email and the password are hard coded um, in here. Um, if you don't get those right, it will turn an error message and then it returns a completion handler. This is sample code, okay? Don't expect, and I told you it didn't do everything I said your password should do. Um, and as we remember yesterday, I could have been worse because password is only the second most common password in the world. So I am more secure than some apps. If you want to know what the first one was, you should have been there yesterday. You missed it. Right, okay. Back to the list. Okay, so we've logged in. We've logged in. Now we're going to display a list. So now we are moving into some navigation. Now we have to do some navigation. Okay, so let's look at how we uh, display the list first, and then we'll look at how we got to display the list. The list model. Okay, because this is, it was all very well having a login model that just has one function and returns a yes or a no. We now have to return data. So this is the protocol for the list model. Okay, I notice it's escaping again, but the thing you really need to take a look at is this. Data item. Data item is a protocol. All data, I mean, when I say the word must and should and will be, I'm talking about in my implementation, okay? These are my rules in my code. You do what you like in your code, so I'm not saying you must do this, but I'm saying in my code, I've said I must do this, which is why you will always seeing it do it, and if you don't find a place where it's doing it, feel free to email me and tell me off, because I need to fix it. So the protocol is a data item. We just have their name and their role. This is the most, one of the most simple data items. If I pass protocols around my app as data, I can actually pass that data, the physical data around in any form I like. Okay? It could be a core data object that happens to fulfill this protocol. It could be a class that's just got a whole bunch of underlying XML and extracts it for these properties by fulfilling this protocol. I could switch my whole data infrastructure underneath without breaking a single thing in my app because it's only passing protocols. Whereas if I'm passing NS managed objects around and everything in my app is expecting NS managed objects, and then I choose to use SQLite directly, I now have a whole bunch of untangling to do and a whole bunch of mess to sort out, which will probably mean I won't make that decision because it's too much work and we will be going along. We could have made a better technical decision. So especially in these areas, protocols are great. Okay, so we have to implement that protocol. So in this app, it's implemented simply with a struct. Okay, the most simple way it could have been implemented. It's actually uh, an immutable struct as well. I do try and keep data immutable if I can, that, that just takes stuff in. Okay, so here's the uh, list model class itself that's going to implement the list model protocol. So um, I'm just going to hold all the data inside the instance of the class. Obviously, if you're dealing with a million records or something, this isn't the way to do it. This is demo code. Okay, you might have to start dealing with paging and all this sort of stuff, getting chunks of data. But you do that exactly the same way you already do that. You just do it through this set of classes, okay? this set of protocols. So hopefully you, you already know about that. So it has a, 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 an array of the data items. Uh, actually, in our list model, we create those data items when the list model is done, because it's just hard-coded data again. There's no database involved in this demo app. I'm just hard-creating the data when it starts up. Okay? Um, your app won't be very good if you do this, unless you just want a fit list of Star Trek characters, or some of them. Okay, so let's look at the main bit. The items class, uh, the items method call, which is how we get the items, it just returns a set of data items. It's just returning the array. So that's all my data model is doing. So the idea is to show the architecture. That all makes sense so far. Some of you have gone to sleep again. Obviously, that wasn't a very good section. I thought that was the best section, personally. That would have got my vote. I'd have been awake for that one. Never mind. Okay, now let's talk about coordinators, because I've been sort of like saying these are the cool bits. They're not, they're just the same as the bits, really. Okay, coordinators. Remember, coordinators are about flow and navigation. So the only code, just like everything else we should find in a coordinator, is something to do with a, making a decision about where we go next. That's it. If you're writing any other code than something that's making a decision about where we go next, it's in the wrong place. It's worth writing these things down at times for yourself. You know, even maybe writing them on your whiteboard or you know, 
coordinators, this is what goes in them, data models, this is what goes in them, and just check, you know, just do the check. It's so easy just to, you know, oh, I've got to get this stuff shipped by five. Yeah, it's, yeah, let's just stick it in here and we'll move it later. And you know you will never move it later. That code will bug you for the rest of your life. You will wake up at night thinking about that non-navigation code in your coordinator. You will, I promise you. I, I'm 50 years old, I know how many sleepless nights I've had about code in the wrong place. You, know? you youngsters don't believe me, but it is true. The older you get, the worse it gets. Be taught, kids. Right, coordinators. Their job is to handle navigation. Equally, it's the coordinators that build the M, what I'm calling the MVVM stack. So what do I call the MVVM stack? You have your view controller, which is your view. Yeah, I'll say that again, your view controller, which is your view. Your view controller, which is your view, three times tends to get it in a little bit better. <laughs> yeah. And then you have your view model, which has a model. Okay? So that, that's the stack. The coordinator normally sets up the stack. So equally, where you are in the navigation flow, it's perfectly feasible to say, I'm going to take this view, and in this instance, we're going to use it with this view model, and actually the data that view model is going to get is going to be from this model. And you have flexibility to be taking different view models for the same view or different models for the same view models, depending on where you want to get the data from in certain things. For example, I've detected in my app that there is no network connection. Therefore, the model I'm going to connect right now is going to work from the cache. Whereas if I had a network connection, the model I'm going to connect right now is going to speak to the network. That's a great way of not having to mix your network in caching code because you just make the decision which model you plug in. Yeah? This stuff does work, you know. Yeah. Honest. Okay, so that's what it's got to do. So let's take a look at how we set up coordinators. Again, this is a little bit contrived. I start with a, what I call the parent coordinator, or the app coordinator, the coordinator of all coordinators, the one coordinator to rule them all, you might say, within your application, the app coordinator. And uh, pass it the windows so it's come to work with, and in my model, in my, in my way of doing things, every coordinator has a thing called start. So normally you set up a coordinator, you call start, you let it then sort out what it's going to do. Okay? Um, and actually, I've set up a protocol, a coordinator class, saying coordinator classes must implement start. Because why not? It's a protocol. We love them. Okay. So what does the app co coordinator do? Simply, in its start function, it asks the question, am I logged in? If I am, I'll call a method called show list. If I'm not, I'm going to call a method on myself called show authentication. Fairly simple so far. Okay. Hopefully readable in any language. So let's take a look at those methods. Show authentication. By the way, I don't know who does this, but I love using extensions in Swift on classes to implement delegate methods on certain things. Some people hate it. Some people love it. I love it. So all the sample code is written this way. Um, it just... I, I keep it all in the same source file. I don't split it up between source files, but just having different sections of the source file, to me, it just, it comes to, um, for me, it comes to where Laura was speaking about this morning. When I scan the code, because I'll always put four blank lines between extensions so I can pick them out really quick, I can scan the code, just read the top line, I know I'm now in the area of the code I want to be. So that bit she might give me a plus for. I'm still failing most other places, but I got one in there. Okay. So show authentication. What does show authentication do? Okay. If you'll notice at the moment, uh, is logged in doesn't do much other than say you're never logged in. Because um, it's not needed in this case. It was there for an example. Show authentication. It creates an authentication coordinator. Okay. So I tend to create a coordinator to do one thing. Okay. It adds the coordinator to an array of coordinators. Sorry, a dictionary of coordinators. I chose a dictionary, it could have been an array. Why does it do that? If I don't, it gets cleaned up by arc. We've got to have some sort of reference to it, otherwise it's going to go away. Okay, so we keep the coordinator. I set the delegate of the coordinator to myself. So coordinators have delegates to other coordinators. The coordinator that creates, in some sense, a coordinator is, gets created, and the coordinator that created it normally becomes the delegate of that coordinator. Terminology is so tough, isn't it? Because I just said that sentence. I knew exactly what I was saying, and it made no sense to me while I was saying it. Um, but you all nodded. So obviously, <laughs> well, some of you nodded. But that's enough for me to say everybody and feel better about it. 
OK, so authentication code there. And then what do we do? We call start, because that's what you do with coordinators. We call start. So the real guts of what's going to go on for authentication will be controlled by an authentication coordinator. I've looked up the code. So what actually goes on in here? Um, it has a window, because it's useful for it to have the window. Let's look at the start method. I'm using a storyboard in this case. Um, I could have used a zip file. It doesn't really matter. You could have built it in code. Uh, basically, I'm extracting the, um, I'm getting the storyboard. I'm extracting the view controller, uh, the stuff I want from the storyboard. And then I set up my view model. I set the model on the view model to an authentication model. I set the coordinator delegate. Remember I said that the view model had a coordinator delegate? That's what it told it to finish. So in our login controller, when we successfully logged on, we called the delegate saying, I'm done. Yeah? That's coming back to this class now. This coordinator class is what's going to be told that the, the login view model has finished doing what it needs to do. I've got a stack, and I set the root. I'm, this is, I'm not using a navigation controller or anything like this. I'm just brute forcing everything into the root view controller in this example. You wouldn't necessarily be doing that. If you do do it that way, that's fine. Um, but if you're trying to get the navigation bar stuff in, you see, in this area, you'd start working with all that stuff. OK, and that's it. It was on the screen. OK, so we've started our app. We've created an app coordinator. It's decided we weren't logged on. It's created an authentication coordinator. The authentication coordinator has created a view, a view model, and a model stack of the appropriate type. And it has put them in as the root view controller, and it's on the screen. Easy, yeah? Broken up, down where it was. Are you still with me? I'm trying to work out if that's an improvement or a decline on last time. It may be about the same. Maybe about the same. Okay. Right. So that's how we started the navigation. Authenticate view model did log in. So this is the method that was being called on our coordinator when our view model had finished. So what does our coordinator do? In this case, this is our authentication coordinator. Our authentication coordinator has nothing else left to do because it's only interested in the authentication flow and the authentication flow is now over. So all it's going to do is call its delegate, which was the app coordinator, and say, this flow has finished. That's effectively what it's saying. The method, yeah, Because I try, you don't want just all these random flows to things. Try and break your coordinators up, or whatever you end up calling them, so that they represent logical flows and logical sections of flow. So again, you can link them in with each other in different places based on their delegate methods and whatever else, as opposed to suddenly having these flows that are locked. Just gives them. So all it's going is back to the app, and it says, the authentication coordinator is finished. Okay? And that's where it comes into this method in our coordinator. And all that says is, great, let's remove that coordinator from our dictionary of coordinators because it's no longer needed. And now we'll do what we'll call the show list method, which is what we would have called in our app coordinator if we'd already been logged on. So it just goes back into the flow. Show list, funnily enough, this code should now look familiar. Show list is creating a list coordinator. It adds a list coordinator to the dictionary of coordinators, sets itself the delegate, call start. That should now be perfectly make sense because we've done it already. Yeah, there's a pattern here as well. We're starting to create patterns. OK, so what happens in here? Oh, look what start does. It gets something from the storyboard because it's the way I've chosen to do it in this app. It creates a stack, creates a list view model, a list model. It created the list view controller, the three of the stack. It set the delegates, and it sticks it on as the root view controller. Exactly the same as the coordinator did. Okay? So all these, uh, the uh, authentication coordinator did. So all these coordinators doing are basically defining a view, view model, model stack, and sticking them up there on the whole. Good? Good. Ten minutes left. I said that to fill you with hope, and that it's almost done in whatever else, um, whether I stick to the manner. Here we go. OK. Right, OK, but we have an issue now. We, let's, let's deal with this sort of master detail thing that we have, because now, we now have the list of data of our crew on the screen. Okay? We've authenticated, then we displayed a list of data. They are two distinct 
UI events. They're not related. It's just coincidence that the authentication, and coincidence is not the right word. It was designed, authentication had to come before the list was displayed, but they were not connected events. Whereas now we need to deal with the fact that if you click on one of the names in the list, you get the details of that person. It's a, it's a from going, drilling down into detail, which are connected events because the data in one has to flow to the data in the other, which is where the connection is. It's in the data. Okay. So this is what we need to deal with next. So we're going to go back now, wind our way back, and we're going to go into our view for the list. Okay. The place where we never put code. We're going to put some code in there. Okay. This is when someone selects the table rower index on the list. All it does, funny enough, tells the view model something is selected at this index because our view makes no decision. You might have code in here that now says, yeah, I know, I know to make this, this highlighted or whatever else or fade or an animation, but that's view code. That's fine. You're allowed that because it's to do with display. Okay, so the view model will have a method called use item at index. It let me make sure I get this right. Okay. It now we have to now decide what to do. We have a piece of data, and it's our piece of data that we've got from a view model uh, model at some point, but we're displaying the business logic for, and we've put on the screen. However, we now need to leave that screen. So actually, my view model is not allowed to do anything with it either, because the next thing we require right now is some navigation. We we need to move in the app. So actually, my view model has to say, great, I've been told we need a piece of data. I'm done. Let's tell my coordinator that I'm done, but this time I will also give it some data that I'm done with. Okay? So it passes the data with it back to its coordinator. This making sense? Someone nod at me because I'm running out of time. These two nod. These, you're now my barometer. If you nod, everybody gets it. So be careful how you nod or you don't nod. Okay? Right. So we go back up into our list coordinator where we were just now. Now, in every coordinator so far, when we've gone back to the coordinator saying I'm done, we've gone back to the app coordinator because we've actually finished a flow. But now we haven't finished a flow, we're mid-flow. So at this point, the list coordinator actually now creates a data detail coordinator to handle the navigation. It creates its own chart, sets itself as the delegate, because remember, whatever creates a coordinator normally then sets itself as the delegate, and call start. So our coordinator has basically created a child coordinator, and as part of the, the constructor of this coordinator, it passes through the data that was selected. He's nodding, that means you will get it. <laughs> I thought that always falling asleep quite a lot, and he gets everything all the time, one or the other. <laughs> okay, right. So, oops. This starts looking familiar. Our detail coordinator gets the stuff, the thing it needs from the storyboard. It sets up the view, view model, model stack. It sets the delegates it needs to, puts it on. I mean, this code is cut and paste, change the names almost all the time. Slightly different, notice that the view model here is taking some data as part of it. That's, isn't that breaking the rules, putting data into a view model in that way? Yes, but in this case it works and why, you know, you, and it's obvious what's going on. Okay, so what happens, so that then displays our detail view stack with the detail view the, for each person. So what happens when the done button is pressed on that? Okay, exactly the same as always happened. Yeah, the detail view says to its delegate, I've finished. It's coordinator delegate, I've finished, which will come back to where? The detail coordinator. And what the detail coordinator does is it goes back to the list coordinator because it says I'm finished. The list coordinator says, brilliant, I'll now set my detail coordinator coordinator property, which is where I stored that so it didn't go away, to nil. And then the list view controller I created earlier on when I was created, I'll just stick it back in the view controller in the in the root view controller. Let me say that again just to make sure. The the detail view model says I'm done. Its coordinator gets the message. That's the end of the detail flow. So the detail coordinator says I'm done. That goes back to the list coordinator because that's what created it. 
The list coordinator says, great, I don't need you any more detail coordinator. We'll just nil you out. And now I've already got my stack I created just now. I'll just put that back on the screen. So we get our list back. Hopefully still in exactly the same place it was before and everything else, because it's actually just been taken off the screen. It's not been got rid of in any way at all. Yes? Good. Right. MVVMC. I know I talked about code. I know I, we went through things specific, but hopefully as engineers, walking through code helps you get the principles. I don't care if you use this code, you call things different things, you link things different ways, you do this, you do that. The point is, that code is maintainable. That code is testable. Almost every class, other than your views there, has no reason not to have every method unit tested. Yeah? And it's easy because even your view models, which require data, because it's a, we're given a model to work with, can be given test models with hard-coded data in. So you're fixing against hard-coded test data. No, no worrying about refreshing databases or anything. It becomes incredibly testable. And of course, you're going to write tests for your test models as well, aren't you? And then maybe write tests for your test model tests, and then maybe write tests for your test model test tests. Are we happy now, Scott? Is that far enough? Do we need to go further? OK, that's good then. <laughs> As long as Scott's happy, we're all happy. That's the rule of the conference. If Scott's happy, we're all happy. Right, so if you want this code, MacDevNet MVVM demo, it, this code as, it is, as we've been through it today is up there. There is also a Swift 2.3 and a Swift 2.2 version. In fact, it turns out the 2.2 and 2.3 versions are identical, but I'd already done the conversion by then and saved the branch, so I wasn't going to delete it again. Um, and if you want to ask me any questions about it, that's who I am on Twitter. Please feel free to ping me. And uh, that's obviously the end of my presentation. And I didn't have a thank you slide that I thought I had in there. But uh, that's how you change your displays.